York Giants. Their defense was muttering to itself after getting strafed by their own mild offense in an intra-squad scrimmage. And so if the Giants' own offense caused their D such grief, what in blazes are the Vikings going to do to them tonight? And as Mark Malone reports, the man whose headache this all becomes is not even going to be there tonight. Giants head coach Jim Fossil endured a tumultuous offseason of change that included the release of quarterback Danny Cannell and the signing of Kerry Collins to bolster an offense that ranked 29th in the NFL last season. Tonight, Fossil will not be present for his team's preseason debut. Instead, he's in Arizona with his ailing mother. I think it's going to be pretty weird because you know, he's the voice of reasoning with this. He's the guy that, that, that gets us going. I know that we're going to be able to go out there and play without him being there because we all understand why he's not there. And, and as a player, you just wish that... Um, you just see his dedication to his family and, and to his mother. It makes you think about your own family. You can really understand that, and our, all our prayers are with him. Jim Fossil will no doubt be keeping an eye on his offense, and in particular, the quarterbacks. Kent Graham will start and play about a quarter and a half before Collins takes charge in the second quarter. As for the Vikings, Randall Cunningham will open the game. and play. He's got some problems. He's got to understand that this is another opportunity in life for him. That coach was Mike Ditka. Those comments came last year. New team, new coach, same situation for Collins in 1999. He's no saint, but might he become a giant in New York? Susie Colbert picks up the Collins story at one of its lowest points after a DUI arrest in North Carolina last November. That's like the motivation of what I don't want to be. You know, like I think about that, and that's... that's I don't ever want to go back to that, you know. Um, uh, it's hard to see that, you know. I, I mean, I, I mean, I, I you know, uh, no one, you know, I, I was very disappointed in myself and very disappointed in, uh, you know, what the way it came across and, and what people saw. Just three years into his pro career, Kerry Collins had been released by both the Panthers and Saints amid speculation of alcohol problems, racism, and a lack of desire to lead his team. I think people, you know, kind of like when they first met him, kind of, you know, were kind of, you know, withdrawn from him because they didn't really know they had to accept him. Well, you know, they moved him around a little bit. <laughs> Not to really get into it, but, you know, he was in one locker. He'd come in the next day, he was in another locker. And I don't think equipment guys moved him. But that's something that we've all gotten over. I really believe this, uh, that a lot of our players talk to other players. And uh, the case was that he is a good guy. Uh, might have done some things wrong, might have been a little bit off the wall here and there, but he's a good guy. Everything he did, he just made dumb mistakes, things that were more from immaturity instead of being a bad person. And when he came in, he really made an effort to get along with guys, and I think the guys appreciated that. And because I knew him, um, I knew he was a little uncomfortable with the situation, but to see him make that effort made me realize that he really wanted to make a change. He didn't even bring a car to training camp because he wanted to rely on other people to drive him around so he can get to know people. It's just kind of, wow, I didn't even think about that. I just kind of, I know you have a car. Why do you keep getting rides with everybody? He goes, you know, I just wanted to, you know, get to know people. You know, I asked Kerry, point blank, what do you have to do? It's easy for me to tell you what I see, but what do you feel? And when he started to sincerely talk about uh, take football more seriously, apply himself, get rid of the outside distractions, he knew he needed to get back to some fundamental work. Those are the type of things uh, that he said. And then I had to feel like they were sincere, and they were, and so we went ahead. I think I've certainly placed more focus on that part of my life and, and, and on that part of, um, you know, what I want to do as a football player and what I want to do as part of this team. So, uh, um, you yeah, know, it's no secret I have a lot of proving to do. Oh, the guy can throw. We sit there. It's amazing. For three years, we didn't throw a lot of out routes. And he sits on the right hash, and they'll throw an 18-yard out to the far side of the football field. And as you're watching the receiver go, before he makes his break, he's throwing that ball. And you're just kind of going, wow, we got to cover that now? <laughs> we never had to cover that before. Still, it's Kent Graham, not Collins, who's number one. I was straight honest with both of them from the beginning. Uh, I told Kerry when he came here uh, that uh, Kent was going to be the starter. He would be the backup, that I felt like that was the best for his career anyhow. I hope Kent does well. Because if he does well, we win. If Kerry plays and, and doesn't start the season, that's because we started bad and we're in a hole now. Uh, for Coach Fossil, you know, Kent plays well. You know, he's got a guy making that much money sitting behind him. It's just kind of, you know, perception versus reality. Perception is, you know, here's the starter making the money. Reality is, no, he's the backup. And that perception extends well beyond the practice field. 
Just outside the gates here at training camp, vendors sell replica jerseys. Just what you'd expect. Strahan, Hilliard, Seahorn. What's surprising is that Kerry Collins, number five, is one of the hottest sellers. And there is no Kent Graham jersey for sale. This is the reality. I'm the backup quarterback for the New York Giants. Um, I'm very, very happy. And you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go with that. Still to come on this show, Tony Gwynn and the practice to the Mets for what he could bring on the field. As the season started, you had to wonder if the quiet and reserved Ventura could maintain that equilibrium off it in baseball's biggest market. But just like John Olerud at first, Robin has handled the hot corner while keeping his cool demeanor. Robin Ventura would rather be seen than heard. Even though he's having a career season at the plate and a gold glove campaign in the field, he still prefers to be just number four in your Mets program and not the straw that stirs the drink. I think I've been this way, um, you know, when I was in Chicago. I, I don't know what it is about, um, you know, that people are, are saying is the difference or if it, it, it is a difference or, or not. Um, it, just, it feels like it's the same stuff I was doing in Chicago that was the reason why I probably got rid of me. The big thing that he brings to the club is uh, some leadership in the clubhouse. And he's just a great guy to be around. I mean, he's a lot, a lot of fun, uh, good sense of humor, uh, you know, just a real character in the clubhouse. When he says things, people listen to him. You know, he's, he tends to be somewhat reserved and laid back. So when he does say something, it has an impact in the clubhouse. We've leaned on him, and he's never broken. And he, he comes up with the right thing to say and the right thing to do, uh, whether it's on or off the field, day in and day out. That theory was tested from day one. Ventura's arrival meant the move of Edgardo Alfonso, who finished second in gold glove voting at third base in 97, to second base. This guy is, is, is unbelievable. You know, I enjoy him, and, and I really, uh, he really uh, makes people here forget about me, so it's a good thing. And, and then he is a tremendous help for us. I think the big thing Robin did early on was he called, it, called Edgardo and, and asked him how he felt about moving to second base. And Edgardo kind of gave him the, the, the thumbs up on it, said he didn't have any problem with it. He was glad to have Robin on the club or to come to the team. And, and I think that once that was smoothed over, it, it made for an easy transition. And, and Robin has fit in right from the beginning. Ventura's fit in so well that in addition to being a candidate for the team's most valuable player, he's entered that rarefied air of league MVP. Just don't tell that to him. You know, I don't know. I, I think, uh, you know, part of it's not knowing people, so maybe it's just simplifying things. I'm just trying to find the ball and, and hit it. Um, you know, I don't really have any precedence of what guys, you know, are trying to do or what they've done in the past. And uh, if I had success off somebody or I haven't, um, it, it's more just, you know, trying to hit it and, and hopefully something good happens, really. He's been phenomenal so far. I mean, he certainly is uh, driving in runs in clutch situations. And the pitch on the way. Played tremendous defense for us. Breaking ball, snagged by Ventura across the diamond. He got him. And led us uh, when we needed a leader. I just have fun here, and, and you know, guys are having fun at the same time. Well, Robin is a five-time Gold Glover at third, but he's never won a Silver Slugger award. He certainly vined for that this season. He appears headed to setting career highs in most of the major offensive categories. No Met has more home runs or RBIs this season than Ventura. Coming up, he won at Watkins the weekend. Only the Expos have made more errors than the Pittsburgh Pirates among all of the teams in the major leagues. And now Piazza, and here we go again. We talked before about what everybody's got to be thinking about. When Piazza signed last winter, the idea was get the big hit, hit the big home run, make the big play to make the difference between the Mets going home early and participating in postseason play. He's going to get a chance to do it here, but against a different pitcher. In the mind, making a play. Brad Klontz, a former Met, will come on from the bullpen with the bases loaded. Well, again, a couple of things to keep in mind here. By loading the bases, you create the force at any base, but the only force play that matters is the one at home plate. Klotz is a sidearm. He's going to be tougher on right-handers and more likely to induce a ground ball, which is what the Pirates need here. First pitch. In the dirt. Gets away. Mets win. The New York Mets are going to some semblance of postseason play.
Yankee Stadium. And Franco going to postseason play. Now the Mets will either play off with the Cincinnati Reds for the wild card or go straight to Arizona. It depends on what happens in Milwaukee and who knows when or if they'll even start there today because the Reds and Brewers are being delayed by rain. But you can't look at John Franco without thinking about the long road that he's had. He came to the Mets in 1990. He's never been involved in postseason play. And technically, again, technically, a wild card playoff game is not considered a postseason game. But it certainly is an extension of a 162-game regular season, something the Mets have not accomplished since 1988. Well, this crowd has been looking to jump all day. The place is rocking, and Bobby Valentine is going to take his ball club either to Cincinnati or to Arizona. Well, I'll tell you, our side has been a fine ball game. Along Chris Vince of a John Franco, 15 years of service in the major league. is standing by downstairs with the manager of the New York Mets, Bobby Valentine. Matty, if you can hear me. Howie Rose, absolute bedlam down on the field. The fans just standing and applauding it. Bobby Valentine pointing right back to the fans, applauding them for their effort. And Bobby, the Mets did what they had to do. 48 hours ago, left for dead. You win three in a row, and now you're assured of at least playing another game. What a marvelous comeback for your club greatest guys in the world. I've been saying that all year and great fans too. I love to see them come out like this. It's been wonderful but you know that wasn't easy Benson. It's just tough as hell and they're going to be tough pitches the rest of the way. It tells us we got one more game and we'll be ready for that one more game. We saw you post game not only congratulating your players but also whispering to them. It's clear by your words by your actions that there's a bond here. This is a very special unit in your eyes. This is a great group. Uh, you know they I can't tell you how much they meant to me. You know, when you talk about support, this is a support system right here. And I tried to give it to them. They gave it to me and gave it to each other. And that's why they call it a team, I guess. They're a great team. Your faith never wavered down the stretch. Even as those losses mounted, you kept saying you felt good that things were going to go your way. How does it feel now that that faith has been rewarded? Well, there, you saw a wild pitch to win a game right there. You know, we got a ball in the sun. And, we're due for the breaks. We got a month of breaks, and this is our month. This is October. When that calendar changed, we won three in a row. It's a new month. And now it's on at least for a game tomorrow, if not on to Arizona on Tuesday. Congratulations, Bobby, on a wonderful 1999, which still goes on. It's a great year, great group of guys. I'll guarantee you that. Thanks. Bobby Valentine joining us here on the field, Howie Rose. Nice of him to do that. I know he wants to get into that clubhouse and talk some more to his team, but he knows the season goes on. What a moment for the Mets skipper and this club. Back up to you. Well, it's going to be a long night for Bobby Valentine and the New York Mets right now because they don't know where they're going other than eventually to a television set and watch Cincinnati at Milwaukee if they ever get going. The game is being delayed by rain. If the Brewers go where the Mets want them to go and beat the Reds, the Mets will head straight to Phoenix and start the division playoffs with the Arizona Diamondbacks. And this is why there's going to be at least one more game. And Mike Piazza batting with the bases running on one pitch. The only objective tonight is to win. As Vaughn runs, Dimitri Young fouls one down the right field line. Dimitri Young is 0 for 3, two ground outs, and a pop fly to center. Vaughn was running, they're not holding him at first base. We've got Pokey Reese at third, and Vaughn at first. This is the 10th time there's been a tiebreaker playoff in the history of Major League Baseball. And up to now, one of the greatest pitching performances ever seen in one of these. And it's caught by Alfonso at second base. And Al Leiter has completed a two-game, a two-hit shutout. And it has put the Mets into the playoffs for the first time in 11 years. And this one was Leiter's first complete game of the season. And at long last, 
the real celebration can begin for the New York Mets. And John, we mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast that Leiter has been there before. He started game seven for the Marlins against the Cleveland Indians in 1997. And, they, and the Marlins won that game. And I think tonight again, he was just on top of his game. He pitched a great ball game. And he was very smart. And again, the Reds have nothing to hold their heads down about. They just ran into a buzzsaw tonight. John Franco, more than 15 years in the big leagues longer than any other current player without ever being in postseason play that drought has ended and he and lighter begin their celebration the New York Mets who were dead it seemed just three days ago are only the second team in history to be two out with only three to play and still make it into postseason play joining the San Francisco Giants of 1962 was the only other one ever to do it and they could be the second wild card to win the World Series because they have a good ball club they've got a good defense when they get good pitching and they can score some runs they're as good as any team in baseball and a nice play there by Alfonso and now they can let it all hang out and fittingly by Alfonso because he got it all started driving in the only runs that Leiter would need for the two run first inning homer just past Leiter but there was Alfonso that great Mets infield comes through again and Al Leiter with a an amazing performance in the biggest game of the year and for Bobby Valentine they were calling for him to be fired just a week ago in New York now his Mets are headed to Phoenix against the big unit tomorrow night. The New York Mets are the wild card champions. Stay tuned now. Baseball tonight coming up next. To take you right back to Cincinnati, John Moore and John Miller, Joe Morgan. Good night. We'll hear from the Mets. Certainly hear from Al Leiter. What a heroic performance he came through with tonight. Next up for New York now, Peter is Arizona, and New York is two and seven against them. But first, the good news. And only the most bizarre set of circumstances led us to this one game regular season. Get into the playoffs, but. This isn't a playoff game setup. Sixth time in Major League history such a scenario is played out. Forget home field advantage in this one. The Mets actually were in Cincinnati in bed late last night while the Reds were swimming laps around the Brewers. So cue the Twilight Zone music. This is the game of the living dead. Both these teams were down, out, and forgotten about. Bobby Valentine fired himself earlier. 1,704 games without a postseason appearance. The most of any active manager. Edgardo Alfonso gives him a lift. Number 27 for Alfonso, 2 0 Mets, two batters into the game. And Steve Paris was dazed. Three batters later, Piazza's at first, Robin Ventura back to Paris, inning ending double play. So Al Leiter's got himself a two love lead, but we know how he struggles in the first. And you know what he did? He walked Pokey Reese, who scares the heck out of him, and so does Greg Vaughn. Well, Al Leiter did a terrific job, though. Mike Piazza calmed him down here. Here with Greg Vaughn, 3-1, the life on his fastball. Got him to swing at a bad pitch out of the strike zone, and then terrific. Look at this breaking ball. Greg did not expect that, especially in that situation with Al on the ropes. And then, boy, look at that. Jams Dimitri Young. Gets the easy ground ball to first base. I love the way he, he uses that cutter. Gets right-handed hitters like Jeffrey Hammonds to just think, okay, it's coming in money, I'll pull it. Well, unfortunately, they can't keep it fair. Then change up away, great pitch. Al had better, good command of all four pitches he went along. There he throws fastball, runs in on on, uh, on Aaron Boone, pops him up, and I'll tell you, Al's a little hyper. Great job by Piazza. Got better as the game wore on. Olerud to right off. Paris, Edgardo Alfonso in the third, goes to third. Robin Venture is on deck. Oh, they walk Piazza to load the bases. Denny Nagel comes in to take Venturas at bat. And with the bases loaded, ball four. Three-nothing Mets. Meantime, lighter. We've seen that cutter. Saw some fastball. Here comes that curveball. Pokey Reese. Man who had two home runs off a of lighter coming into the game. Goes one for three with a walk and a meaningless double. Now here's Sean Casey. Well, Al has had some trouble with left-handers at times, but great breaking ball to Sean Casey. Dominated them tonight. And then Ray Ordonez. What a thing to watch. Ray Ordonez, Alfonso, and Pokey Reese all in one game. Makes every med pitcher a lot better. Ricky leaves the yard. 
off the foul pole. Ricky Henderson passes Bobby Bonilla on the all-time home run list. And Ricky sort of celebrates. And how about Danny Nagel? In the six, 4 nothing Mets, Alfonso. Is he the MVP of this team? This one to the alley and left off Danny Graves. Ordonia scores 5 nothing Mets. Three RBI in the game for Alfonso, who goes two for four. Leiter continues to deal. Barry Larkin. And Larkin didn't think this was strike three, but he punched him out anyway. And the Mets loaded up the champagne. And now Leiter continued, trying to get his first complete game of the season. Two down. And it is game, set, and match. As Alfonso comes up with the final out on a heroic pitching performance from the lefty Al Leiter. For the Mets, it was only their fifth complete game this season. Give Leiter all the credit in the world, and certainly the people in the field. Alfonso, Ordonius, Robin Ventura had another great game. So 5-0 the Mets win. Bobby Valentine exercises the ghost. He is live with our Mark Schwartz. Mark? It is a number that Bobby Valentine has heard probably more than he wants to. 1,000. <laughs> wow. Thank you, bro. You gave it to me all night. That was Ricky Henderson, huh? Who cares about that stuff? Talk about this team. This is a great team. Who cares about that nonsense that people like to write about? You should write about this team. This is a character, a group of characters who have character. They're the greatest great group of guys anybody could be around. And, hey, Jack McKeon's group was as good, if not uh, even better, than most teams who've ever been in the playoffs. And what a season they had. And uh, just to my coaches and the organization, my players, my friends, my mom and dad, I know you're out there. Bobby and, and everyone, this is, just, this is just a start. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Bobby, you've been through so much. The team lost seven straight games. Everybody counted you out. How were you able, as the leader of this group, to get them back on the right track? I took it from them. I just stood back and watched. They knew what they were doing. They told me they had it together. I knew, believed it right from the day, day one. And uh, when they said, just let us make a play or two, and uh, I sat back and watched it, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate it for 97 games so far, and uh, actually for 163. And we'll get over to Arizona to see what's going on. Obviously, there is there is that monkey off your back now. You have finally you have finally gotten to the postseason, Bobby. Because of this guy, how about the game, Al Leiter? How about Al Leiter? That's what it's all about right there. It's not about getting to my postseason. It's that he wanted it. He wanted it badly. These guys wanted it badly. That's why we're going there. And I'm riding along. All right, Bobby. Let's, let's talk to Al Leiter. Al, we thought we'd have you as an analyst this Thank year God. for baseball tonight. Tell We're about Schneid, to make the I'm call. Happy as heck I'm not going. <laughs> the call and was Ravi and whoever else is over there. The commissioner. <laughs> Tell me about the effort tonight. I mean, the first inning, you had the two-run lead. You walked the first guy. Yeah. You gave up a couple yeah. of shots. It looked like you might have a rocky outing, no but doubt. then. Well, let's face it. Any game like this is uh, you, you feel the emotions and the mind plays a part and obviously uh, the first bat of the game walking him wasn't a good idea but I settled down a little bit I got uh, Larkin out and uh, just went with it but once I settled down I felt like I was able to change speeds a little bit more I used my curveball and then we get up three nothing after the third and a game like this I could tell some of those guys were pressing Vaughn swung at a high curveball and uh, a couple other pitches were normally maybe perhaps they wouldn't have swung at I got a little lucky on it Casey Vaughn and uh, Young their three four five guys go 0 for 9 how important was it to get the middle of the order the way you did well it's important in any middle of the order and obviously uh, I knew what Vaughn was doing of late and uh, all of them really Casey Tobbins he's been tough so uh, I think what I did was uh, I sat with Mike before the game and I said of all the guys I'm a little more careful with Vaughn uh, he was the one guy you couldn't let beat you yeah absolutely I, nothing against Dimitri but I, you know you just feel like if I if I let Vaughn get away uh, you know I have Dimitri and then I think Hammond down the line uh, but uh, it's a great team and it's a real shame uh, that a team with 96 wins has to go home and it, it says a lot about that ball club and uh, they had a heck of a year how much did the Reds help you by swinging at some bad pitches? A lot, uh, you know, especially once I established a strike in in, in the uh, in a count early on, and then they swing at a bad pitch. It just enables me to relax and loosen up a little bit. Well, Randy Johnson's next. Yeah, well, hopefully we'll be real loose on that ride to uh, Phoenix, and uh, let's have fun with this. This is fun. All right, Al. Okay. Boy, we're gonna miss him as an analyst <laughs> for baseball tonight. I'm telling you, he was good. Mike Piazza on this side of me. Mike, come on this side. We got Mike Piazza, the catcher. 
of the New York Mets. And Mike, you've been here before with the Dodgers in two situations, once against the Reds, once against the Braves. And in both cases, the team was swept. How badly do you want to turn this thing around for yourself as you look ahead to Arizona? Well, I mean, not just for myself, but for this ball club. I mean, you know, a week ago, it's funny, you know, you read all, all the papers in New York, and they all had us buried, and, you know, there was no miracles left. And, and obviously, we were very down, and we had a tough streak, but we hung in there. So now, I think our attitude now, everything from here on out is icing on the cake. So we've got to play a tough Arizona club tomorrow. Hopefully, we just keep it rolling. You know, we don't want to stop to think about it too much right now. Just enjoy this for the moment right now. Al Leiter did not complete a game all year long, Mike. How was he able to summon it up in game 163? I can't explain. I, you know, I think he was obviously jittery early on, as we all were. And I think Fonzie came out, hit the big home run, kind of took the pressure off. And, you know, he was getting ahead of guys. And he was throwing strikes. <laughs> Kill me, Mike. Kill me. <laughs> and we SPM picks up the dry cleaning on this one. But, uh, you know, he just threw a great game. We were very happy. We just had some very good team offense. And, you know, the last week we've been getting back to the things that were successful for us the whole second half. And, uh, you know, that's just something I, I hope we can continue. That's all. How much does this mean to Bobby Valentine? Needless to say, he's been reminded of it. 1,704 <laughs> games without a postseason appearance. I mean, you know, Bobby's just one of those guys. I, I really at times feel sorry for him because he really uh, – he wants so bad to win, and sometimes, uh, you know, his emotions kind of take over, and he just obviously goes crazy, and it may rub people the wrong way, but deep down inside, he just wants to win, and, uh, you know, obviously, it's a big monkey off his back as well, and um, so, again, like I said, we, we don't have much time to enjoy it, but we're going to enjoy it tonight and, and hopefully come out swinging tomorrow. How do you feel physically after 163 Beat up. games? Beat up. I mean, you know, I think the, the toughest thing about it is we kind of put ourselves in this position, you know, when we, we had that streak and every game was so critical. Ideally, you'd like to have, you know, four or five days before you start the playoffs to get in there. But you know what? Now, like I said, the attitude is such that we, we just weren't expected to be here. So now everything from here on out is just, you know, we have that attitude like, you know, we got nothing to lose. I mean, it may not be the case because there was a lot of expectations on this ball club, but you know, that's the way we feel. And uh, before the last week, we just said, you know what, let's just have a good weekend, finish strong, and, and kind of just get that that sort of karma, that, that idea that we didn't finish strong last year off our backs. All right, Mike, thank you so much. Thanks, Ron. Appreciate it. Mike Piazza. Ricky Henderson is now going to be joining us, the left fielder of the New York Mets. Ricky, the bat speed's still there after all these years. The bat speed's still there, you know. Uh, it was just a great game for us today, you know. The biggest thing for us to do is probably just come out there and get a few runs early for Al and let him relax and uh, he pitched an outstanding ball game for us. You've been with great teams throughout your career. You've been to the World Series. Does this team that you're on now have the same qualities and characteristics that can let them go deep into the playoffs? I think it, this team uh, have the quality to go out there and, and put us in a, a great position during the playoffs. So we just got to keep our head up and go out and play nine hard in each and every day, and, and we got a good chance of winning. The Cincinnati Reds seemed to be a team that was flat this game. I mean, this team had played so well all year, and they just swung at bad pitches. They really helped Al Leiter a lot tonight. What do you think happened with Cincinnati? I don't know. You know, they came in late. They had a late game yesterday, and they came in late. To, and the biggest thing, you know, they was up for the game, but, you know, Al was throwing a good ball game. We got some runs. A lot of times when you put some runs on the board early, you know, it, it make them look flat, and Al was throwing a great ball game. All right, Ricky Henderson with the home run. Thanks. Moving on to face Randy Johnson. <laughs> Thank you. Edgar Alfonso was the hitting star of the game, certainly for the New York Mets. He actually got the game-winning hit early in the first inning. He was the second batter of the ball game, and then produced another RBI double later in the ball game in the fifth in his third at bat. Let's go back to the studios. We'll have Edgar Alfonso.